Okay. Now, we're going to pray and uh, trust that as the hour goes, that the Lord is going to bring precious things into our hearts. And uh, only God can communicate truth to our hearts. And uh, because His truth is more than just what's in our heads. And so we may think that we understand what we're hearing. But we need the Holy Spirit to bring illumination, to bring light into our hearts. Alright? Because His truth is light. And his truth is also life. Okay. And that's why the truth of God uh, is so living. Truth is not just principles and just teachings. Because truth is a person. Jesus is the truth. That's why when, G when God brings his truth to us, it is more than a principle, a teaching, a concept. It's more than a doctrine. And uh, it's more than a theology. Yeah. It's, it's life. And this, and this. It is a life quickening, it's life giving. Right. So, and uh, it is important for us or Christians to understand that truth is not about us having together more information, more ideas, more concept in our minds. Truth is to bring us into the life of God Himself. And that's what Jesus had to suffer all His life when He was on earth. Because, because Jesus spoke to men and women all his life who knew or who had truth in their heads, in their minds. But the point is, so Jesus, Jesus' audience were not pagans, were not idol worshippers, were not people who, you know, uh, worship uh, false god and demonize gods and goddesses. And I'm now wondering sometimes, would it be even easier if Jesus had spoken to people like that? Jesus spoke to men and women who, uh, who knew the truth, who understood the Bible, who understood the Torah. And they became uh, the hardest, the most close up, the most, the most blinded of people. And they were convinced that they knew the truth. They understand the truth of the scripture. And so convicted they were that they were the one in the end who caused the death of Jesus. 
But the point is, all right, so how important it is. And uh, so when the Lord bring his word to us, bring his truth to us, there is only one intention, there is only one purpose that God wants to bring his truth to us. It's to bring his life to us. It's to bring his spirit to us. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen. So let's go to the Lord tonight, shall we? So Lord, we're thankful for this occasion. So we continue to look to you because you are indeed the giver of life. You are the author of life. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your heart. We thank you for your truth. And we need you once again to bring your truth to us. Because without your truth, we have no knowledge of who you are. We have, uh, we have no knowledge of your ways. We don't know how to love you. We don't know how to follow you. We don't know how to come to you and to give ourselves to you. So Lord, we thank you. Come to us and bring to us once again the, the very life of your truth. For you are the spirit of truth. So bring to us, Lord, that spirit of truth in our midst. And uh, you know our hearts here. You know us by name. You know where we are within us. And we ask that you will continue to search our hearts. We pray that your light will go to places within our hearts. And begin to bring changes in our nature. Lord, we thank you. We look to you. We submit to you. We ask once again for your presence because of your lordship, because of your kingdom. So we long for you. We seek, we seek you together as your people. We thank you, Lord. Bring those who are on the way here. Bring those who are on the way to come to this meeting. So that Lord, none of us will miss out the very thinking which you are doing here. For this we are thankful. And we are indeed privileged here tonight. Thank you, Lord. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Now, so let me invite you once again this evening to the letter to the Hebrews. Now, Hebrews is my favorite book of the New Testament. Because of the richness and because of uh, the immense depth of what the Apostle taught the Hebrew Christians at that time. Now, no one is still certain as to who is the author 
of this letter to the Hebrew Christians. And uh, most people seem to believe it's not the Apostle Paul. Some say, some say it's the Apostle Paul. So we're not here to debate about that. But the content of this letter was written to Christians, but Christians who were Hebrew by origin. In other words, they were Jews. And uh, so we need to understand that to understand so much in this epistle. Is also to have a good understanding of the Old Testament. Alright, so without the knowledge of the Old Testament, reading Hebrews can be difficult. And, uh, and even having understand the Old Testament, as we should understand the Old Testament. It is sad that today a lot of Christians have no knowledge of the Old Testament. And some time ago there was a preacher who says that, that you can actually tear the Old Testament and throw it in the dustbin. All you need is the New Testament. So, but until we understand what is in the Old Testament? And to understand the Old Testament is to understand the ways of God in the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament reveals God's purpose and God's intention. And and God reveals his intentions and his purpose for many, many ways. Alright? And so once we don't understand the ways of the Lord in the Old Testament, then reading this letter to the Hebrews is going to be a problem. And so may I say to you that as you grow in understanding of the Old Testament, you will finally grow in appreciation of this letter to the Hebrews. Now, at the foundation of the letter to the Hebrews is actually is the issue of the priesthood. Alright? Because the Jews understood, they think they understood the priesthood. Because they were the first one who received the office and the ministry of the priests. No other people on the face of the earth was, was called into this privilege. They were the first people. And so, when the apostle wrote to the Hebrew Christians, the apostles was wanting to once again tell the Hebrew Christians mm -hmm. who Jesus is. Jesus. Who truly Jesus is. Jesus. They thought they knew this Jesus. <laughs> but what they did not know is that they didn't know him enough. They don't know him as he should be known. Now, there is something about knowing Jesus and yet not knowing him enough. 
Jesusыг мэддэг гэхдээ хангалттай мэддэг үүс. I want to say again. За дахиад хэлье. There is something about knowing Jesus but not knowing him enough. Тэр Jesusыг мэддэг гэж нэг асуудал байна. Jesusыг хангалттай мэддэггүй байх гэж бас нэг асуудал. That was why I shared with you my story last night. Тэр учраас би өнгөрсөн орой таамал төв байхаа болсон. I know him. Би түүний мэдэн But I didn't know him enough. And every time when we don't know him enough, something happens to us. Alright? When we don't know him enough, something happens to us. And there's one thing that, that will happen to us when we don't know him enough. We will not come into freedom as we should. There's something about knowing Jesus. There's something about the knowledge of God that brings freedom to our lives. Now, I know that it's easy for all of us Christians today to say, You know, ever since Jesus came into my heart, I'm free. The other Christians just thought that Jesus means to stay far away from the cross. How should we treat the other Sunday? Yes, that's it. I know that. Because I knew it on the first day when the Lord came into my life. As clear as it is today that I can stand here and tell you what happened 45 years ago. I knew freedom. No one had to tell me within my heart, in my spirit, I knew I was free. But that's 45 years ago. But I found out that there were so many other things that I'm not free from. Remember what I said last night that this journey, this this life of faith is a journey. And and as the years went by, and as the years of all of us, as it goes by, one of the joy. That God is going to come to bring into your life. It's the joy of knowing that there's a freedom that we yet to enter into. And somehow this freedom is tied up with the knowledge of Jesus in our lives. Бид мини Есүсийг мэдэх мэдлэгээр одоо хязгаарлагдаад байгаа. Got the point? Ойлгож байна тийм. All right. So let me say this here to you. We know Jesus. Бид Есүсийг мэднэ. But always remember that we have not known him as we should. Гэхдээ та үргэлж энийг мэдэх хэрэгтэй. Бид түүнийг мэдэх ёстой хэмжээгээрээ мэдээгүй байна. Even when you do think that there are moments where you seem to think you know Jesus so much. Та Есүсийг маш их мэдсэн юм шиг тийм There is yet so much more you don't know. Can you understand that? Every time when you feel as if that, wow, God, you gave me such a truth. Wow, that was such a wonderful thing. And know that there is some. There is, there is more that you don't know. There is more of the freedom that we have not entered into yet. And that keeps you safe. That keeps you trusting. Then that keeps you in the simplicity of the faith. That keeps you like a little child. The joy of being a child is that the joy that the life of a child is ever learning, ever growing, 
Bad stupid. Ever changing. Bad bullshit. Ever developing. Bad bullshit. Ever maturing. Bad bullshit. See that? That's why Jesus said, unless you're like a child, you shall know wise enter the kingdom. <laughs> Got the point there, some of us? Some of us here, we've grown so much, so old, so knowing all. That's why you're alien to the kingdom. All right? You've lost the childlikeness. You've lost the singularity of your heart. Single. Your heart is single. These are the characteristics of being a child. Child is never complex. It's only single. You walk through the door and just the child will just know that directly recognize you're the father, you're the mother. They are not, they're not confused. <laughs> so and I want you to turn with me this evening. Back to the seventh chapter of Hebrews. Now, it is impossible for me to read a large section of the scripture with you. So, you have to follow my thought as I move along with you. Because I'm after something here tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm only after one thing here. For, for all the time that we're here together. And so therefore I'm putting, I'm dropping you little, this little, what do you call this, little hints to tell you what you need to do after this four days. You need to read the letter to the Hebrews. You need to concentrate, by the time you read the letter, you need to concentrate chapter chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 13. Every chapter is important. But these four chapters are going to be very crucial. Because the whole foundation of the letter to the Hebrews was concerning the priesthood. And the, and the apostle understood that the very person of Jesus Christ that's why when you open to the first chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, it's the whole exaltation of the person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the Son. That God throughout the ages has been speaking to his people. Alright, the God has been speaking to the children of Israel for thousands of years. To all of the Jewish fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Alright, Joseph, Moses, all through the ages. And then in the end, God said he spoke through them or through the prophets. But finally, God is going to have his final speech. Because after this speech, God is not going to say, he's not going to say anything else anymore. Now I didn't say that God will not speak anymore. But whatever God's going to speak in all of the future, He speak from this final speech that He's going to give. 
харин тэр ирээдүйн талаарх бурхны бүх ярэн түүний эцсийн хэлсэн үгтэй шууд холбогдож байгаа. Эцсийн хэлсэн үгтэй төвлөрч байгаа. God's final words to humanity. Хүн төрлөлт нь хандсан бурхны эцсийн. God's final speech to mankind. Хүн төрлөлт нь хандсан бурхны эцсийн is the, is the person of Jesus Christ. Is that? Jesus Christ. Is that? the point? All right. And God will not speak or use any other method, use any other means anymore. God is going to do that anymore. There isn't Jesus and some more. No more. Jesus is all Jesus is God's final word and speech to all humanity. Jesus Christ өөрөө эцгийн хүн төрөлхтөнд хандсан эцсийн үгэн байсан. And then the, the, the apostle began to write. За тэгээд их бичиж хэлсэн. How do we understand this person? Бид яаж энэ хүнийг ойлгох вэ? How do we know this person? And so as the apostle begins to write, the apostle begins to open up the whole concept of the priesthood. And this is something which all the Jews understood. Because this is how they all began there in the wilderness of Sinai. That's exactly what happens when they were delivered from Egypt. They were in Egypt for 430 years. They were slaves. Generation after generation. And they were living in Egypt. The ways of Egypt have gotten into their blood. You live long enough in the place, you become like a place. Got the point there? You live long enough in the place, you become like a place. Meaning, you become like what the culture is. What the behavior of the people is. What the lingo of the people is. Got the point there? If I stay here in Mongolia long enough, I will, I will start to act like you. You understand what I'm saying? Now, if you go to certain countries, there are certain things that you notice that are very peculiar to the people. Give you an example. If we go to Philippines, because I have spent a lot of time with Filipinos. We used to teach a lot of Filipino students and Filipino pastors and pastors' wives and leaders. So I make an observation one day. Because every time when you talk to a Filipino, there's something about their facial expression. They actually not only talk to you, but they actually use their face. They move with their face move with their words. One of the things they do is they do this, they use the eyebrow and do this. <laughs> See that? So I thought initially it was just one, two or three people who has that. Then I noticed that everyone has that. <laughs> and even when they laugh, you know when you laugh, you just, you know, you laugh. And it's just that when you laugh, there is one single facial expression. <laughs> but even when they laugh, they move the eyebrow. <laughs> And then, now this is in a span of 20 years. I make observation for 20 years, so I cannot be wrong here. And it's, it's, it's even with little children, with grown-ups, all right, with, with pastors, with leaders. And so then I came to the conclusion that this is because, because they, they grew in the land, they grew with the people. 
of God's calling upon your lives. But they were Egyptians by spirit. They were Egyptians by ways. They were Egyptians perhaps even by thoughts. They were even Egyptians perhaps even by behavior. So you have to understand that, that great deliverance in the book of Exodus. That God intended to bring the people out of Egypt and plant them in the wilderness. And then teach them the whole concept and relationship of being a priest with him. And God knew how risky that was. How difficult that was. How painful it's going to be. And how, and how costly it's going to be. How hard it's going to be. God knew that. He's God. He knew the risk. He knew that this is this is this is no guarantee. So what do you think at the end of 40 years in the wilderness they all perish in the wilderness? The, the entire generation that came out. They came out with Moses and Joshua. They all died in the desert. And it was in those 40 years, no people on the face of the earth was entrusted the attributes and the office of the priest. Did the Jews understand what God, what God gave to them? Taught them? Did they really understand what the priesthood was? I don't think so. Because year five, this is what, this is what, uh, let me see, this is thousands of years later. This apostle, whoever he is, have to write to the Hebrew Christians who have come to know Jesus. But though they came to know Jesus, something was wrong. Something was insufficient. Something has happened. Something is stopping this Hebrew Christian from going further. They, they know the Messiah. But there's something about the freedom that they have not entered into yet. There's something about the rest of God that they have not entered into yet. Got the point out? Now these are the things I'm talking about. They are all written here in the book of Hebrews. And so this apostle, and that's why at the back of my mind, I'm always suspicious that Paul seems to have something to do with this letter. Well, one day when we see him, we ask him, did you write Hebrews? <laughs> Because his name is not here in the, in the letter to the Hebrews. And so, this apostle begins 
to open up this whole concept of the priesthood. Now, with this as our foundation, I'm going to move quickly. And you need to test what I'm saying. I'm speaking to you by reading the scripture. So I cannot stop every five minutes to refer to the scriptures because I need the time to develop this thought with you. Because I only want intention. I'm after something here tonight. Remember the story that I left you with last night? That we cannot know him unless we are like him. That was my life changing moment. That was what sometimes we English people, uh, we English speaking people say, it is the paradigm shift. You, know, you understand the paradigm shift? There is, a, there is a paradigm shift. Everything is different from now. We, we cannot know him unless we like him. So, but we're not like him. None of us is born like him. None of us carry anything within ourselves in our fallen nature that looks like God. That's why some of us who are Sitting here, we need to understand that uh, there are people, there are humans that are good. There are some goodness in every man. I know of thieves, I know of cheats, uh, cheats, uh, cheats, and liars who does good things. Yes or no? So doing good things is 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 not just coming from uh, from good people. It comes from bad people. But those goodness that comes out of our lives, they're not God's nature. You see, this is why we need to understand things like that. Got the point now? They're not from God. They just they just left what we call the left behind of what Adam is as a man. And everywhere in the human race there are the remnants, the left behind of some of the good traits of human being of human beings. You know, I remember when I was a young kid going to church, I had uh, two dollars in my in my pocket. One dollar was for bus fare and the other dollar was for offering. While walking to the bus station, I was mocked. I was stopped by someone with a knife. Pocket knife. Uh -huh. He said, give me what you give me everything you have. I was 17 years old. I've, I've, never, I've never had an experience like that. So the, I, I saw the nightmare in front of me. So I started shaking. And out of my shaking, he said, give me all you have. So I mean out of fear, so I took out the two dollars. And the moment he saw the two dollars, he got angry. <laughs> I thought he said, "What do you carry so little cash?" <laughs> huh? He said, "What are you walking on the road with so little money in your pocket?" <laughs> 
I remember, I don't know what came over me. This is what I said. I said, I said, I said, one dollar is for Jesus. The other dollar is for Pastor. <laughs> then the moment I mentioned Jesus, I said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to church. <laughs> so it was as if like, you know, I was shaking and yet I knew how to say this. I said, one dollar is for Jesus. One dollar is for Pastor. <laughs> He pulled one dollar. He said, I pity you. Give it to Jesus. He mocked me. He took my money. But he gave me the dollar so that I could give offerings to God. What do you call that? What I'm trying to bring across to you here is we're capable of goodness. But those goodness are not God's nature. And the sooner we grow, the sooner we understand this. The sooner our relationships are going to get better in the church. That's why today we were talking about what really is Christian leadership, what is actually church leadership. One of the things you have to learn here is that no church leadership must operate on the grounds of human goodness. You never choose a man and a woman to be a leader in God's house because that person has natural goodness. Got the point there? They are natural goodness in people. But that, but that is not the criterion for choosing him or her as a leader and raise them up before the Lord. And many church leadership, many churches got it into problems because we trusted human goodness. How do we know what is human goodness and the goodness of God's nature in us? Sometimes they, look, sometimes they look so alike. How, how can we discern? How can we? How can we? We we separate. How can we know? How can we make the difference? Well, well, stay together as a church. Grow together. Be tested together. Go through trials together. Go through, go through all of the, the hardships and the afflictions and, and the suffering of being together as a church. Suffering is going to test everything. Suffering is going to test all of our human goodness. And you always find out how good is human goodness because in suffering it usually disappears in less than two and a half minutes. <laughs> if it is God's goodness, if it is God's nature, it will endure. It carries the characteristic of long suffering. Long suffering. Patient. It, has, it has the capacity to wait, to hang in there, and not to give up, and be faithful. Are you here? 
All right, so we don't have detectors today and put it under armpit and see and then lift up the armpit. Oh, it's human goodness, throw it out. Okay, Peter, I thought, has only she says that in the church was posted there, but not to whom is her husband's a kind of teacher. We don't have instruments like this. He's beginning to hurt us, child. All right, and we cannot know him, not by ourselves. We cannot know him by any powers that is within us. Any capability. Any form or any display of human goodness. Got the point? We can't. It's not, it's not about it's not about giving our entire life to Christian service. It's not about giving all my money to the poor people. Because sometimes we seem to think that all of this is going to cost my heart and prove to God how much I want to know God, how much I love God. Now, at some point in our lives, God has to bring all of us into that place. There has, there has, to, there has to come a time where there is a surrender. And there is a knowledge. There is a dying. There is a yielding. There is a coming to an end of all of this human ability of thinking that I can know him by some ability, by some achievement, by some strength or power that I trust in. That is truly the beginning of our Christian life. That is truly the foundation of our spiritual relationship with God. So for many today, that day must come. That's why ever since you became a Christian, some of you have been asking, you have no end of problems. You have no end of trouble. You have no end of struggle. Have you ever asked why? Because God is trying to empty you. Yeah. to empty you out of your own ability and strength to think that knowing God has something to do with what you have on the inside. And God will not let you go. In other words, what I'm saying is the discipline is going to keep coming. The circumstances will come against you until a dying comes, until a breaking comes. Got the point now? Is to finally understand I cannot anymore. My knowledge of Jesus. My true knowledge of Jesus must first come from him. Hallelujah. And how is it that it has to come from him? It is his nature. I cannot know him unless I'm like him. So that is the foundation of our entire Christian world. I don't care how old you are. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you have served God. I don't care how great God has used you. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. But this foundation 
is good. Must be achieved. Is good. This foundation is good. must be visited again and again and again. Is good. That's what happened to me. That's what God did in me. He visited me, reminded me, worked in my heart, established my foundation again. Not that I don't know him. Not that I don't know him. But I don't know him enough. I have not known him as I should. I have not known him as intimate as I should. I've not entered into a far greater freedom as I should. So God has to bring this to me. He has to once again show to me. You've got to be emptied out. That you have to allow me to put my nature within you. Because the degree in which you allow me to put my nature in you will be the degree in which you can know me. So that has cost me to serve God. This has cost me to push towards uh, in a way that I've not pushed before before the Lord. It cost me to hunger. It cost me to desire Him. You know, it's strange, isn't it? Every time when God begins uh, begins a work like this, He puts a new desire. Alright? He's going to put new desire. And so, so that's, that's exactly what happened as I shared with you last night. I became like a little child. I had a new desire. I had a new desire for his nature like I never had before. I had a longing for God's heart and God's nature like I never had before. See this? Truth, as I said. This is God speaking to me in truth. But truth that causes something to happen to my life. It's not truth that gives me more information. So I begin to have greater desire. Greater longing. And, and this is when God begins to show, God begins to teach, God begins to open. So, now very quickly, let me say this here to you. Why did he choose the priesthood for Israel? That's exactly what he wanted to do. Remember what I said when we left last night? That the essential nature of a priest is a mediator. So as a mediator, a mediator stands before God and stands before man. Not the point? Of it? So that's why the position of a mediator is so important. And so, God begins to teach Israel. He brings the priest before him. Now you notice that the priesthood is the only office in the Old Testament in which God goes into minute detail of everything that the priest is going to put on. Alright, it's very important. And these details were shown to Moses up 
in the mount in the mountains of Sinai. They, they are not any other thing that you know just out of nowhere it's up to Moses to copy what design, what garment, what color, what helmet. You understand? Because the, this is very important because the priesthood were tied up with two things. All right, this is how quick I, I got to move and you got to register this. Yeah, 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 yeah. The priesthood was tied up, number one, with the tabernacle. Because while Moses was up in the mountain, Moses received the pattern. Pattern. Like an architect. He received the blueprint. All right. He received the physical uh, uh, structure of the, the tabernacle. All right. The tabernacle is also known as the sanctuary, is also known as the tent. Now, listen, why a tabernacle? Because it reveals that God wants to come and dwell with him. Alright, the tabernacle was to reveal to Israel that God is going to come down and his presence is going to walk amongst men. You see, you see how wonderful God is? That is his heart. That is, that is, that is his reality. But in order to communicate that reality, to communicate his heart, so what does God do? He used physical designs. Alright, he used physical designs to express his heart. Are you here? Now it doesn't mean that that tabernacle is really where God is going to stay there 24 hours a day. But that tabernacle was already a symbol. Was already, was already a shadow. Uh, we always say that you know shadow and substance. Right, so I see I see Mars shadow. But I don't talk to Mars shadow. Because Mars shadow is this a shadow. Hello Ma, how are you? There's something wrong with you. I need to, talk, I need to see the real person. Because this is reality. This is substance. Got the point so far? So Moses was given the shadow. It's all in physical form. So you may remember that Moses came down and a, a tremendous construction began. All the children of Israel were involved. All of them have to give their best and all of the jewelries, all of their gold has to be poured out and given away because all of these structures need these materials to build. So what are you saying now? The priesthood is tied up with the tabernacle. The priesthood is tied up with the presence of God. The priesthood is tied up with God's intimate, his desire for intimate relationship. His priesthood is tied up with God having to be, to have his presence in the midst of men. The first one. The priesthood, second one, is tied up with the laws. Because up on that mountain, Moses, God also gave to Moses the commandments. Not only the Ten Commandments, but all the other ordinances and statutes. How Israel is to live. 
How Israel has to be obedient. How Israel has to order their lives in accordance to what God wants. How Israel is to conform their life to the moral orders of God. Because, because the law was God's moral nature. Got the point there? For I am holy. That's God's absolute. That's the foundation of God's being. Thou shalt have no other gods beside me. Oh, I'll tell you how we've lost the commandments today in the church. Alright, thou shalt set aside a certain day, on the seventh day thou shalt worship me and observe the Sabbath. Some of us here, we're still working on Sunday. We still open our businesses on Sunday. Listen, very important now. So all of this was given to the children of Israel. So here you are, and then comes, of course, all of that which God gave to the priests. Now, I know some of you here would have knowledge what uh, was told by told to Moses to prepare the garment of the priests. All of that which God put on the priests, it came from God. And the first thing that the priest is to do is to stand before God. So every piece of the garment every article every colors now I won't go into all the details God instructed Moses to put it on and the first person of which was to stand before him was Aaron his sons were to serve together with him. They were the sons of Levi. So sometimes it's known as the Levitical priesthood. Got the point so far? So every time when they begin to dress themselves, the priest comes before God. What is, what is it that God sees in the priest? What did I say to you? That they were only symbols. They were only shadows. Pointing to the substance. They were only, they were only symbols. Pointing to the reality. So look up here. So when the priest stood before God, and he saw this entire priestly garment, I don't have to name it for you, but you may remember I said that the priestly garment was from the crown of the priest's head all the way to the sole of his feet. His entire body is covered. What is it that God was actually seeing? He is seeing the very nature of himself. That was the very person of Jesus Christ. What the Father was actually seeing in the body of the priest was all of the display of the character of Jesus. Are we clear so far? That's how, listen, very important, that's how the priest was to come to serve him. 
We all have grown up knowing that service is by what we do. No. It began by this. Service is by nature. Service from a man to God is first of all by nature. It is service by nature first, then comes service by action. No one is more busy than the priest. Are you here? Thousands upon thousands of Jewish children bring all the sacrifices to the tabernacle. Who does the slaying? Who does the slaughtering? The priest. So from sunset, from sunrise to sunset. I tell you, every night when Aaron returned to the camp, he looks completely bloody. <laughs> From slaughtering a pigeon to slaughtering a, a bull or bullock. You know how hard that is? There's no machine. There's no hand. It's good work. Fossil work. Hard work. <laughs> but all of the work has only meaning. All of the service is only meaningful when service is first by nature. And many of us Christians today have run out there. We have done the service of killing bulls and bullocks. And we have forsaken our priesthood of taking on his likeness. We have forsaken mm -hmm. the ministry of putting on his very nature in us. And when one is neglected or at the cost of another, we're going to pay. We are going to pay. And something will happen. And this is the story of the church in the last 2,000 years. This is the story of so many men and women today in ministry. The sadness that I bear as a growing man in my country to watch so many men and women. Suffer the consequences. And the consequences of having to perform one at the extent of the other. That's why there's so much a problem today in the service that we have given to God. That's why there's so many problems today in the things that we have done for God. Because it begins from in the inside. So far so clear. So every time the priest came, it was commanded. And by the way, this is only once a year. Aaron as the high priest of Israel. God himself all dressed out. And walk into the presence of God. And there he was. In, that, in the presence of God's Shekinah glory. 
Did not appear. He was appear. He was appearing to see, to see what? Not just to see the man Aaron. He was to see what Aaron has obediently, through Moses' instruction, putting on the entire full suit of the full display of the garment of the priests. You see this given to us. This is recorded for us in the Hebrew. In the, in the four chapters that I spoke with you. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. Very important now, I want you to see this. So this is this is the foundation. You need to see this now. No, no other office. Express this desire of God. Far more than the priesthood. And all of this, what what Aaron was doing before the Lord, what Aaron was presenting before the Lord. Where was he doing it? He was doing it in the tabernacle. He was doing it in the sanctuary. He was doing it in the place that he appointed to come and be with men. Have you ever longed for God's presence in your life? Have you ever longed the God that I would walk with you all the days of my life? When you, when you start to talk like that, when you start to pray like that, what are you saying? God, I want you to tabernacle in the midst of my life. Lord, I want to live with you. And I want you to live with me. I want to walk with you. I want to consistently practice your presence. I want, I want to be constantly be found in your presence. It's not about feelings. It's not about emotions. It is, it is a sense of almost as if whether you're conscious or you're not conscious. There's a word called no, K N O W. No, yeah. You just know that God is with you. That's what the presence of God does. It goes beyond sensation. It goes beyond just your feelings. It is a knowing. It is a concrete, solid knowing of God's, pres of God's presence. Because, because that is tabernacle. That is God's dwelling. But you see, listen, he doesn't dwell apart from his priests. He makes the priest to function in the tabernacle. How can God ever live with us in an unpriestly man and an unpriestly woman? How can God share his presence when we are unpriestly? Is you starting to understand him? How can it be? How can, ever, how can God ever manifest his presence apart from his own priests? The tabernacle cannot be without the priests. His presence cannot be without a priest serving him. Got the point now? 
They're important. So many Christians today, we want your presence. Lord, I want your presence in my life. Good longing, good prayers. But understanding when you start having that desire, what does it imply? What does it mean? It means that God's presence is never without his own priests. So far so clear? So he doesn't come and spend his moments. He doesn't come to share his presence in an unpriestly character. He doesn't share his presence with a man and a woman who is not practicing his priestliness. And when Aaron marched out of the tabernacle, what does he do? He announced and proclaimed the commandments. Are you listening here? You see how it's all tied up? He announced and proclaimed the will of God. It is in his priestly function. It is in the presence of his tabernacle that Aaron received the counsel. He received the mind of the Lord. He received the laws of the Lord. And he finally goes out and proclaims that word. You know how many men and women today are proclaiming words that has no tabernacle and no priestly character? We, we wonder why today people are not truly hearing the counsel of the Lord. Why the church is not truly hearing the counsel of the Lord. Because something has gone wrong with our priests. And that's the reason today why there is false gospel and there are erroneous word in preach across the nations of the world. That's why there is such a confusion of message. That's why there is a, there is a barrage of every man saying that this is God, that says the Lord, this is God, that is God. And yet in the in the preaching and the speaking of this word, the hearer, the hearer, which are men and women today, remains unchanged. Do you know that when Aaron stepped out to proclaim the law, even animals have to fast? Now it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that animal stands up and proclaim a fast on their own. It simply means that men will impose even the animals to fast. It simply means even animals have to behave when God speaks. When God truly speaks, even animals will behave. So many of us are going to meetings we're not behaving. Our behaviors have never been altered. Why? Could it be because something has broken down with the priestly, with the priestly function? 
you seeing this now? Very important. Now, I just said all of that. And as you hear what I just spoke very shortly like this, do you know that everything that I spoke was not real to Israel? Do you know that? All that I just spoke a while ago. All that I just spoke. I spoke about Aaron being the high priest. I spoke about Aaron putting on the priestly garment. I spoke about Aaron going before the presence of the Lord to minister to God. I spoke about that it, as Aaron stood before God, it was God watching his own nature in man. How many of you know that it didn't come to pass? Aaron wasn't like that. Not the point. Got it? Which means that Aaron was sinful. Got the point there? Aaron was sinful. Did the presence of God come down in the tabernacle? Yes. It came down. And, 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 and Aaron marched out to the, to the children of Israel. Proclaimed the commandments. When they heard the word, did they change? Are you here? Do you see how real God is? Why? Because God was using all of this as a shadow. It was only a symbol, it was only a shadow. So it was always, listen, it was always in the mind of God that it would not be permanent. There you are. That's in the Mongolian version. <laughs> you got the point? Yes, okay. Uh -huh. Because listen, if all of that which we spoke was real, mm -hmm. then the apostle didn't have to write the letter to the Hebrews. Got the point? Yeah? If all that we have spoken a while ago was working, then the apostle said, then Jesus didn't have to come as a high priest. Got the point now? Yes. Now you see the point. Yes. Yes. And by the way, uh -huh. Jesus don't even qualify as a priest. Why? Yeah. Because his line is not from Levi. It's only the Levi line who is a priest. He's from the line of Judah. So he's disqualified to be a priest. Got the point now? He cannot be a priest. Because he comes from a different line. Why was that allowed? Why did God allow that to happen? Is, is to show to Israel. Is to show to all of us. Listen. That that cannot. That line won't work. That line is only a symbol. It's only a picture for you. It's 
it's only for a moment. It's only a passing. It's only temporary. But it, listen, but it will not fulfill the very desire of the Father. Can you imagine that Aaron was the high priest? God chose Aaron. After that, God never chose any more high priests. Nowhere in the scripture that God said, okay, now high priest number two is going to be Aaron's son. God never said that. But if you read the Bible, the son assumed the role of the father. That uh, they are his priestly government, they put on and they function as priests. And you know what happened? Read Old Testament. Year after year after year. After year. After years. After decades. Listen. Who was the man that finally sentenced Jesus to go and die? Who was the man that finally opened his mouth? You know what? It is not time for you to die. It is determined you are finished. We're going to we're going, we're going to finish you, we have you killed. Who's the man? Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel. And throughout the whole testament's history. There's close to 60 to 70 high priests of which none of them were appointed by God. They came through literally through natural presumption or through presumptuous you know, uh, office. Well, my dad was the high priest, so I'm going to take on the are you understanding what I'm saying? All that I spoke earlier, and then Aaron came into the tabernacle, it was supposed to represent the sanctuary of God. Where the presence of God is to come down and dwell among God's people. I'm not saying that he didn't come down. I'm not saying that he didn't manifest his presence in the tabernacle. But I, I don't believe that there was an abiding presence of God in the tabernacle. Because, Israel, because listen, because the children of Israel in the wilderness were sinning against God. God cannot dwell in the camps of his people when there is sin that hurts him and breaks his heart. I believe that Aaron did receive the counsel and the commandments of God. But I believe that when he went out to proclaim it, I don't believe that the children of Israel broke down in repentance and they sought the face of Yahweh. Because if they did, the fiery serpent would have appeared in the desert and sting them and caused thousands to die. Because if they did, the sons of Korah would not rebel against the leadership of Moses. Are we, are we clear so far? If they did, they would not murmur and complain about, about quails, about manna in the desert. No, they did not. You see how important that I'm telling you now this? And that's why, listen, are very important. That's why another priesthood has to, has to come. 
Another new order of the priesthood has now to appear before God. The Levitical, the Levitical priesthood has served his time. The Levitical priesthood has been a picture pointing to that which was coming. So that's why Jesus has to come. And from the Aaronic priesthood, God is now preparing to change the order of the priesthood. Change the order of the priesthood. So the Aaronic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood has finally come to an end. It's not producing the results. It is not fulfilling the very desire of God. So what did God do? His change was centered in the person of Jesus Christ. But there was a problem. He had his mind that his son is going to lead the new order of the priesthood. But what's the problem? The problem is that Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. But yet, he still wants his son to come and bring the new order of the priesthood. So in order to bring Jesus as the new order of the priesthood, God has to change the nature of the priesthood. Amen. It's no longer the order of the it's no longer the order of Aaron. It is going to be the order of Melchizedek. Got the point? Out? So Hebrews chapter seven introduced to us who Melchizedek was. So, so this, is, this is so powerful because there has to be a change of priesthood. Because, because God has not changed his original intention. His, his, original, his, his original intention is that his nature has to be shared with men and women. And he will only share it through the ministry of a priest. Got the point there? He won't share his nature, he won't impart his nature apart from the priesthood. And he established it even with Aaron. That's why God took painstaking, all right, very painstaking time to dress Aaron in the priestly garment. Because every part and every aspect of the garment was to be a picture of the character of his own son. Because every part of that priestly garment was a reflection of the eternal personality of Jesus. Because that is what he is satisfied with. Amen. 
You see the point there? That's what he was satisfied with. He didn't save you and I is so that we retain or we keep so much of our life to ourselves. He saved us. He saw that salvation is going to bring every part of our entire life to bear the eternal <coughs> personality of God. Do you know that's exactly what makes you a human? Do you know that's exactly what the destiny of our humanity is all about? That we will bear the eternal personality of God himself. Because it's only when a man bears the eternal personality of God that God truly sees that he is a man. Look at what happened to man today. Look at what man has become today. Look at our lives. Look at, look, look at all that we have taken on. Look at all that we have image. Look at all that we have, you know, become in, our, in, the, in, the, in the persona of what we are today. That's why it's so easy today in our civilization for icons to appear. Come on. Why do you think icons are so powerful in the world? Huh? Why is icons so powerful? Why is one Michael Jackson so powerful? Why is one Elvis Presley so powerful? Why is one Mao Zedong so powerful? Why is one Lennon so powerful? Icons. Why is one Adolf Hitler so powerful? Because listen. In our bankruptcy, we're looking for conformity. Our life is meant to conform to someone far greater than ourselves. Are you listening here to me? You ask many young girls and young boys, why do you like Michael Jackson? The moment Michael Jackson do a twist, all the girls and boys go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you fathers and mothers go back to the bedroom in front of your son and do the same twist? <laughs> you can't. You probably land him in the hospital. With a broken hip. <laughs> because why? Because you can't do what Michael Jackson do. An icon simply means that there is someone in which, which is greater than I am. I can't do that. But because he can do it, he's going to be my icon. Listen, and our humanity was meant to put on the image and put on the personality of one greater than ourselves. And when God is not our eternal personality, we start to see icons. We start to look at people, at men, at individuals, a person. It could even be your husband or your wife. It could even be your children. They become your replacement. They become your adoration, your aspiration, your dream, your worship, the center of your life. And we were created so that 
men can be the reflection of the eternal personality of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came to the earth. That's why Jesus took on human form. Because he was the radiant of the Father. He was the expression of the eternal personality, the eternal nature of the Father. And how can he redeem you and me and yet not allow you and I to be the same as he is to the Father? How would he lay his life down and save you and I and yet not require that the same, listen, the same destiny that was in him is the same destiny that is going to be in you? Jesus Christ in Dr. Bessenter Hoftelsen, Tanny Dr. Banner, Tanny Hoftelsen was first. He lay in Ku in Boston till we drink our second day. That was God's very original intention. In a Bosnian answer, that was God's ultimate intention. Got the point out? That's why he began by having to devise the priesthood. That's a picture. Because it's easy for God to communicate like this to people. That's why he designed the priesthood. Hallelujah. That's why he designed the tabernacle. That's why he gave the law. It was all towards this. This is what he wanted. So God saw the failure in Israel. Was God angry? Yes. He's angry when Israel don't obey. But he's not angry to the point that he won't forgive. He's not angry until he lose temper and he throw out his eternal purpose. Because he's a God who sees the end from the beginning. So the moment when he did this with Israel, at the, at the beginning, he already saw the end. Hallelujah. He saw where this is going to go. That's why he was forbearing. That's why he was gracious. That's why he was compassionate with the children of Israel. That's why he knew that this is only going to be for a season. It was served only for a time. Got the point out? Alright, this, this is only for a season, for a time, that's all. What, what was he waiting for? He was waiting for the reality. He was waiting for the actual priest. Hallelujah. He was waiting for the real priest this time. Amen. That's why Jesus is not just the high priest, it's the great high priest. <laughs> and he's not only just the great high priest, he is the kingly high priest. Are you listening? Are you listening here? That's, that's why God was anxious. He was, he was desirous that this has to happen. And that's why the Hebrew Christians in those days were hanging on to some of the old traditions of the Old Testament. So the apostle wrote to them, he said, guys, don't hang on to those previous Traditions of the Father. And you're still looking for the priest to put on all the garment and walk before you and stand before you. You still want that? So the apostle said, but that old order is over, has passed on. The new order has arrived. 
He said, a new order has arrived. He said, the person of Jesus Christ and his priesthood is no longer after the order of Aaron. He's going to be after the order of Melchizedek. Now, suddenly, Jews understand this. Because Jews remember the story of Abraham. For one moment, it's kind of what? Melchizedek? <laughs> yeah, we remember the story. The story, the story was Abraham went and battled with the five kings, defeated the five kings. <laughs> and on the way back home, he met King, he met Melchizedek, <laughs> the high priest. Now, immediately when Abraham saw Melchizedek, Abraham, Abraham exactly knew who he was. Now, Hebrews chapter 7 introduced Melchizedek. And I tell you, it's tremendous because Melchizedek has no genealogy, no father, no mother. He said, and, 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 the, and the apostle said, he's like Jesus Christ too. He has no genealogy. See that? You see the mystery now? He said, you remember in the end that Abraham paid tithes even uh, to, to Melchizedek? So even Abraham at that very time recognized that he is the greater. And I am the lesser. Amen. Hey, when, you, when, when you have beaten five kings, you don't feel lesser. You feel very great. You feel like they just got. He just came away from a tremendous victory. I tell you, he must be swelling with pride and with glory. But when he, when he met Melchizedek, he immediately called his head and he immediately offered and gave to Melchizedek. Because he recognized this is so prophetic. He recognized that the greater is to bless the lesser. Oh, oh, if only we would we can understand this in our life. The constant, the continuity of being in the place where you are lesser and you need the greater to bless you. Now listen, very important there. And then the, and then the, Hebrew, the Hebrew writer said, he said, Melchizedek. He said, he is the king of Salem. He's not only the king of Salem, he's the king of righteousness. He's the king of righteousness. And he's also the king of Salem. Salem means peace. Which means he's the king of He's the king of He's king of peace. Are you listening here now? Very important. He said, he said this is the new order. He said, now Christ in it. And Jesus will be in this order of priesthood. For eternity. For all eternity, he's going to be the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Very important. I want you to see this. This, this is the shift now. This is the new order. All right, the ironic priesthood came to an end. The meaning is still there. The purpose is still there. But it failed. He couldn't achieve the purposes of God. He couldn't fulfill what God desired. His desire has never changed. His original, ultimate intention has never changed. And so here you are, and God already knew what He needs to do. 
So he changed the order of the priesthood. Because why? Because this doesn't work. The ironic doesn't work. But the Melchizedekian is going to work. Hallelujah. Jesus is the king of righteousness. Jesus is the king of peace. This is very important now. And this Jesus is going to become your savior. This Jesus is going to become your indwelling nature. This Jesus is going to be Christ in you, the, the hope of glory. And this Jesus is going to be God's great high priest. Are you listening here? This is the Jesus who is the living stone. And he's going to have, he's going to save men and women and become living stones with him. This Jesus is going to be the head of the body. So he's going to be the head of the body. And this Jesus is going to be the groom to the bride he's going to marry. For what purpose? For what purpose? So that he can he can dispense, he can give righteousness into your personality. The king of righteousness can put righteousness in your entire being. The king of peace can put his peace within us. Are you listening? God could not put it in Aaron on the day. Yes or no? He could put it in Aaron. Aaron went out there and can put it in children of Israel. All he had was just the symbol of his garments. Are you listening? And only he can enter the holiest of all. And all the tens and hundreds of thousands of children of Israel can't enter with him. But with Jesus, all men shall enter. Because he was the sacrificial lamb that tore the veil. His body was the veil. So when he died, the veil tore. So that all men shall find a new and a living way into the presence of the Father. And because he is the great high priest, he who saved us now are also priests unto God. That's why Peter understood this. Peter said that we are a chosen people. A royal priesthood. Never used before. Never used in the Old Testament. He wasn't royal. Aaron wasn't royal. All his sons were not royal. There was nothing regal. You know, the word royal means regal. There's something that is just, uh, what do you call it, noble. There's nobility. The strength of character. There's beauty. All right. That is, that is display of grace and graciousness, of sweetness when a man is royal. Royalty is, royalty is rich, it's exquisite. Royalty is expensive. 
There's no cheapness in royalty. You listen here. It's a royal priesthood. Because Peter saw that. He saw that the destiny of the church is the destiny of a royal priesthood. He has to save us and make us priests. Salvation is to put the trademark and the very seal of God's priesthood over our lives. Because without that, because without that, he cannot remind anyone, any man and woman today. That the priesthood signal that he's going to come and dwell in the midst of his people. It reminds men and women that the priest was to stand before God in constant ministry of giving to God all of the eternal personality that God puts within him. It was to remind men that everything about a man is to receive counsel and the laws of God written on the inside. The old covenant, the covenant that God gave to Moses in Sinai, how was the law given? Ladies and gentlemen, when God gave the law to Moses, how was the law given? When the Ten Commandments came to Moses, what did God do with the Ten Commandments? How did he write it? He wrote it on tablet stones. I don't know how it looks like. It must be frightening. For 40 days and 40 nights, Moses had to witness the terror, the terror of God's presence. And, and Moses said by his finger of fire, I'm just using this, I don't know how God's finger looked like. I think it is only symbolic. I, I think the word finger of fire is only a figure of speech. But it tells you how holy God's commandment is. And so holy, so holy that God dare not even write it on human hearts. Because human hearts cannot bear the moral laws of God. We will fight God together. We will fight God to our last breath. Remember the story of Israel? While this was going on, when God was giving the law to Moses, what was Aaron and all of those men and women down there doing? Hey guys, they just came out of Egypt. They saw the most earth-shaking ten miracles that any human will ever get to watch in all human history. And they have the guts and they have the they have the depravity to raise modern uh, golden cows and worship another god. Do you understand the strength of men? Hearts of men. It takes a long time for all of us to learn about human hearts. That includes even the good hearts. I've seen more churches destroyed by good men. I see more ministry going down because it is run by very good men. I see pastors make mistakes because they trusted good men. Because we were naturally good. I remember I was in a church, I was in a Baptist church many years ago. Pastors wanting to make the treasure of the church. The pastor wanted to have a treasure, a treasure, 
Lo and behold, the sister came back from England. Graduated as an accountant from the London School of Economics. Four years he has left, she left the church and went to study, came back as an accountant. And immediately she made her, and she was a very good girl. And immediately she said that you're going to be the church accountant, the church treasurer. I know, I know this pastor very little. I have other friends that knew him. And my other friends that knew this pastor were not very spiritual brothers. You know, not spiritual. Yeah. It's just an ordinary guys, once in a while they go to church, they're not spiritual. Sometimes they curse, they swear. And so this brother, his name is Vincent, he went up to the pastor and said, Pastor, you, you, you better be careful, you don't choose her as a treasure because this woman will problem you. Because he came back in the room one night and he told me. So I said, uh, the, you know this woman? Hey brother, no need to know this woman. Uh, you want to look, you can tell her me, you cannot trust what his wife. I don't really know this pastor. So, against all advice, he, she put, uh, she, he picked this woman and became the treasurer of the church. I think six months to a year, the entire church was wrecked. Pastor was kicked out. And this came from a this came from a brother, supposedly a brother, you know, who was not even spiritual. Sometimes, 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 sometimes it's almost as if God has to use a donkey to talk to you, even that we don't understand. Since God uses a human, you don't understand, so he uses a donkey. And even a donkey, we don't understand. Which means we're worse than a donkey. <laughs> Why do you tell the story? Because when God wrote the commandments, he could only write it on stones. The most sacred or the very moral revelation of God has to be written on stones. When God writes, when God writes his, his, his moral laws on stones, how many of you know that stone don't change? Remember that? Stone don't change. But sometimes our rebellion, sometimes our disobedience, sometimes our, our resistance to God can be so severe, can be so bad. Remember what Jesus said to his wife? He said, all of you think that you're all children of Abraham. And just because you think that you're all children of Abraham, so that means, you know what, there's a kind of an air and, and, and status about you, pride about you. You know what Jesus said? He said, I can use all these stones and raise up sons. You think, you think God can do that? I think he can, but I don't think he will. Why does God turn stones into humans? Any more than when he wrote his commandments on stone, his heart must be looking forward. And he doesn't have to write on stones anymore. 
So what was the promise? So that's why God said, I'm going to cut a new covenant with you. And this time, through Jesus Christ, and the blood of Jesus Christ, and the new covenant, I will no longer write on stones. I will write on the tables of your heart. Is there in Hebrews letter? Yes. Got the point now? Amen. He saw that the king of righteousness and the king of peace can begin to write. Got the point now? That's why he got to have priests after his order. That's why we must listen. That's why he's looking forward for men and women to be priests in his presence. Because it is in the function of our priesthood. It's in our relationship with him as priests. He begins to write his commandments on the tables of our heart. And to write his commandments in our heart is to write his very nature into our hearts. Hallelujah. And once for him to write that into our hearts, is for God to recognize that his eternal personality is being recreated in us. And when we bear the eternal personality of God himself, then our very personality becomes the dwelling place of God himself. Our eternal, person, our eternal personality becomes the dwelling place of God. And when God dwells within that eternal personality, then God begins to share his mind with the person. He shared his will with the person. He shared his counsel with that person. All of us here today, we spend our whole life as a man and a woman. What do we do? We think our own thoughts. We fulfill our own desires. Isn't it? We do our own will. Because what all natural men on the earth do every day. The whole foundation of human civilization is man, what? Living out, thinking his own thought, doing his own will, fulfilling his own desire. From a bus driver to the president of a nation. What do they do every day? Is to think their own thoughts. Fulfill their own will. Alright? And to ensure that their desires are to be achieved, are to be realized. Because the natural man has his own natural personality. And that's what our human personality is going to be. You can't help yourself. You keep having to think your own thoughts. That's why today look at all of the mental breakdown in the nations of the world. 
uh, our country, our Malaysia, the suicide rate has been going up. I was in Sweden one and a half years ago. Sweden is considered, is considered the most modern nation on the face of the earth. And the highest suicide rate in Europe is in Sweden. Every Swiss, every Swedish is cared from cradle to grave. Grave is when you are a baby. Grave is when they bury you. From cradle and to grave, the Swedish government will care for every citizen born into Sweden. It's, it's a nation that has no needs. No needs. Every need of every human need has been met. And yet, their minds is going out, is going off. Are you listening here? The natural man thinks natural thoughts. You fulfill your own mind. You think your own thoughts. You run your life according to what you will. You pursue the desire that is inside you. And God is saying, Who will share? Who will share my mind? Who will ever know my mind? Who will ever fulfill my will? Who will ever be the one whose very desire is totally given up to me? No one. Not until God gives us his personality. Not until God gives us his nature. We can't get it by ourselves. And God has appointed a way. He has appointed a way to receive that personality. He has appointed the priesthood. He has appointed men and women by redemption, by salvation, that we will be priestly. Have you been conscious about your priestliness? Ever since you got saved, are you checking? Are you conscious? Are you convicted? Are you prick? Are you cut up? Are you pursued? Are you haunted by God? Because every garment has to be put properly. You're, dri you're driven into the presence of the Lord. And she, and she cannot commune with you. He cannot communicate with you. He, he cannot communicate with you. He cannot bring his presence to you. Apart from seeing his nature in us. That's why, that's why we must stand in his presence as a priest. We must allow the high priest, the, the great high priest, Jesus himself, to bring his righteousness into us. To bring his peace into us. I don't know how many of you will understand the next word, the next statement I'm about to make. I'll still say it. And then we'll wait for it whether it can be explained either tonight or if not some other time. <coughs> the priesthood is the administration of the kingdom of God. The priesthood is the administration of the kingdom of God. Remember what Paul said? 
He said, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. So what is the kingdom of God? When God begins to rule, what happens? First, it is what? Righteousness. And every time when there's righteousness, what comes? Peace always follows. Always, always remember, when there's righteousness, there's peace. When there's righteousness in a father, there's peace in a family. There's righteousness in the pastor, there's peace in the church. There's righteousness in a marriage, there's peace in the family. If there's righteousness in a husband, there's peace in the wife. If there's righteousness in the father, there's peace in the children. Righteousness and peace will follow. And when there's peace, joy will follow. Joy will follow. For the kingdom of God is a righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Are you listening here? And God has chosen the priesthood to be the administration of God's kingdom. God has chosen the only office that you, the only office that is far supreme than any other office. I said to you that Jesus today occupies in that office and will occupy in that office for all eternity. He's a priest forever. After the order of that Christ. <coughs> and if you and I are to be priests unto him, and this is what he needs. Because it's in that priesthood God begins to administer righteousness into our lives. He administers peace into our lives. The word peace is shalom. It's a Hebrew word. Peace is not the peace that we understand today. Peace in modern understanding is no war, no disturbance, no chaos, that's peace. That's not shalom. That's world peace. That's, that's what the United Nations is fighting for. The peace of God, the peace of God is shalom. Shalom means what? God can bring to fruition, God, God can bring to, to completeness everything that He wants. Peace means that God can bring to fulfillment, bring to completeness everything that He wants. Which means, in, in simple English, God wants to make us whole. Hallelujah. It is in His presence. God begins to make us whole. This, this was the reason why the Apostle wrote the letter to the Hebrew. I actually want to give you a break. But looking at the time, I'm going to just push it a little bit further and then we're going to close. You must read this. You must seek this with all your heart. And this is today the crisis that is in the church today. The church, by and large, has forgotten our priestly function. Everywhere I go today, everywhere in the nations, the church is constantly having to make men better fathers. 
илүү сайжруулгаараа дээр хүн болох гэж байнгын тэмцэлдэж байна. That's why the seminar, the seminar, the conference is to, to teach men how to become better fathers, better husbands. Тэр нөгөө итгэгчдийг сайн аа баг, сайн хөр байлгах гээд бүгд конференц семинар How to run our families, how to make our marriage richer, more romantic. Яаж илүү романтик байх вэ? Everywhere I go. The emphasis. We use every possible resources today. We invite speakers, we bring them off all over the world and invest big money so that these men can teach our men how to become leaders and fathers and husbands. I'm yet in my entire lifetime, I'm yet to come into a place that says, Come, let's become priests unto God. I've seen I've seen very good fathers. I've seen very able fathers. I've seen very successful fathers. But they're not priestly. I've seen great husbands. I've seen very loving husbands. I've seen great leaders. Powerful leaders. But they're not priestly. And there's a price that will come with this. And the moment when we abandon priesthood, when we abandon our priesthood, when we forsake our priestly function, there is no telling anymore. Though you may be a great husband, there is no telling one day the great your ability of a husband may not even come from God anymore. It is starting to come from strength and area that you have tapped into that you don't even know where they're coming from. There's no no, you may be a great leader. You may be a great husband. You may be a great man. You may be a great father. You may be a great pastor. But if you ever forsake your priestly function, there will be no telling at some point in your life where your success is coming from. Where your life source is being drawn from. Many men's and life source are not drawn inside the holies of God. Many men have lost the art and the skill of entering into his presence and beginning to function as a priest before God. And that's why, isn't it strange? Isn't it strange? That it is in the holies of all that there is completely no light. The outer court has sunlight. The inner court, the holy place, has got the light of the candlesticks. But the holiest of all is completely dark. Do you know that? Do you know light is powerful? Light is energy. Sunlight is energy. This electric city is energy. Light equals energy. But it's strange that it is the holiest of all that is completely with no light. Yet only once in a year it is truly lighted. And that is when it would enter into the holiest of all and the presence of God and His Shekinah glory becomes the light. It is almost as if God is saying, that this light 
That's why it's completely dark. You're not supposed to like it. God is not like this world. He doesn't borrow the natural lights of the sun, of the candlestick, of the electric city. He is the light. He's the father of lights. And he's wanting men, he's wanting men to come be, be beyond the natural light. Beyond the candlestick light. Draw light from me. Draw light from me. Take on that light from me. And when you don't, how soon? How long? Whatever you are, as a man, you start to draw light from the sun. You start, you start to do, draw light from natural powers, from natural sources. You know, strange today, all church growth, all mega churches depends on light. Today, to make the church grow fast, the first thing you do is to decorate your church with lights. Isn't it strange? You should make the whole atmosphere of the church very conducive. We're starting to depend on natural lights. Starting to depend on the sunlight up there. It's starting to depend on the ways of the world. How long do we be successful? How long before we starting to draw from powers and lights that is other than the light of God? It's a, long it's a long lesson for all of us. And that morning, years ago, was my turning point. That was the morning. That was the day. I understood. I didn't know God as I should. I don't know God enough. I thought I know Him. I've served Him all my life. I follow His will. I've done everything by all that I know is to be right and my conscience tells me is true. But I knew that something on the inside of me was missing. And something has to take me beyond where I am. So I knew. I knew then. He said, You cannot know me unless you like me. Because I knew. Don't you think that God knows that all of us is not like him? This is what we call it in English is this uh, a rhetorical question. I know that so you know sometimes when God says things you already know. He he knows what he's saying, and yet he wants to say it, he knows what's gonna come out of it. He even know I know. Then why say it? Why say it? Because what God wants to say is because He's waiting for a response from you. So when He said to me, when He dropped this in my heart, You cannot know me unless you like me. He wasn't judging me. He wasn't condemning me. 
He wasn't making it difficult for me. He was inviting me. Seek me. Come. And that was the journey I began. That's why the priesthood began to come alive in my heart. I said to them, teach me to be like you. I don't want to pretend that I'm like you. I don't want, I don't want to try to be like you. But teach me. I know all of that. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to. I don't want to act. And I want to. I, I don't want to be, you know, a play act as if, you know, I'm like you. We can act. We can act these things out. All right, we have time in the church long enough that's for some of us to act kindness, to act love, to act sweetness, to act forgiveness, to act mercy. We can act all these things. We can go home and drive our wives to mental asylum. We can act these things. So I said, God, teach me. Teach me. Seriously, teach me day by day. And this was my journey. It still is my journey. To be priestly. To serve as priest. Amen. Is it a good one day with Guru Are you full time? Some of you get embarrassed. Are you full time? Which church are you going? Uh, living church. What are you doing in living church? What office? What leadership? What yeah. gifts do you have? You're going to have a question like that. Yeah. I had a man came up to me at 55 years old in Malaysia. I finally can serve God. I've served the government for 35 years. No more. I can now serve God with all my life. I said, okay, I'll take you to the church. I'll take you to the church. I'll take you to the church. I said, how old are you? I said, 55. What have you been doing? Who have you been serving? I've been serving the Malaysian government. Everybody knows that. So what, what do you plan to do? He said, from this point on, I'm going to serve God. I asked him, how? Huh? And suddenly, uh, I don't know what. Uh, try to pray and see and seek the Lord and see what happens. <laughs> See, this, we're waiting. We're waiting for an office. We're waiting for, you know, a job. We're waiting for a task. We're waiting for a project. And I said to this brother. His name is Robert. I said, Robert. Robert. Let me correct you. Robert, You should have served him in the way you live. <sighs> when you were 54. You were 53. Then you were 50. Then you were 45. Then you were 32. Then you were 30. You should have served him. You should have served him in your personality. Very difficult, you don't like that. You don't know, it's not difficult. It's just that we have gone wayward. See, some of us sitting here, you're waiting for this. 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 You're waiting See that? You're not a priest. Sorry to say that. You can go to the bishop's church. Like Robert, he can go, he can go in the end, he became full time in the church and serve as a church, as a church manager. You can. You can serve, you can, you can go out there finally and draw sunlight and draw natural light. Electricity. And I've seen so many men today that have never been able to pass the veil and to stand in God's presence 
as the priest before Melchizedek. In the Old Testament, the veil, the veil was made of uh, linen. It was cloth made with linen. The apostle, the apostle wrote to the Hebrew Christians. What is that veil today? What is that veil that separates the holy place from the holy zone? The apostle writing to the Hebrew, he said, the body of Jesus. The body of Jesus. What happened to the body of Jesus? When was the veil torn from the top to the bottom of the temple in the, in the temple of Herod? The moment when Jesus gave up his spirit. That means he died. He gave up his spirit. And until some of us, and until all of us give up our spirit. Until we yield. Until something in us finally say it is finished. Until we yield. The veil will never be torn in our hearts. And we can never take our place as a priest before our great high priest. And that's why for so many today, the putting on of God's nature in our life has taken so long, has gone so many delays. And that is the reason and that explains why the majority of men and women sitting in our churches today are so immature. The immaturity is not because you're not educated. Your immaturity is not because you have no talents. Your immaturity is not because you have no money. Your immaturity is not because you don't speak well in a certain language. Your immaturity is because your life has not put on the nature of Jesus. And usually, the lack, listen, the lack of that nature in us is the reason why we disguise our maturity by gifts, by talent, by upward achievement, by all of these things that we get. There were many years in our fellowship. We have natural talents in our church. They can play guitar, they can sing. But those with gifts needed to grow up. You have gifts, but they don't grow up. Gifts don't mature you. You can learn to play the guitar better and better and become super talented in Mongolia to play the guitar. They don't mature you. Oh, I'm very good in leading cell group. However good you are, it doesn't mature you. Doing things don't mature a man. Maturity comes when he, when he functions, when he performs his priestly function. So we were not waiting for some of these brothers who can play guitar to come up here to lead us. We, we, we said, just hang on, just wait. 
So for a long time we sang with no instrument. You know, you know how is it like in a church when you sing with no instrument? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey. Some high, some low, some. Some <laughs> All kinds of tears. Got the point there? Come on, you want to feel emotional? That's how we all felt. I, I want to feel the... So those of us, people like Eugene who has a louder voice and is better with tune, you know, he's not, he's not tone deaf, he has to, we have to raise our own majesty, <laughs> worship <laughs> his majesty. <laughs> We can wait. You can put it You see, he suffered. You see that how eternal personality is so difficult. That's why so few want to pass the veil. So many is still behind the veil. They have not stood after beyond the veil. What's the difference between the last day's church? Two, two kind of churches will run parallel. One will stand behind the veil, one will stand beyond the veil. Two churches, two kind of church will greet Jesus in the final coming. One that will stand behind the veil. As close as the veil can be. Have you seen men stand in front of the veil? I But they will not go beyond. They do all the roll, they jump, they Cast, they'll pray, they'll bind, they'll lose. <laughs> but it's still behind the veil. <laughs> Not until you go beyond. <laughs> so, you can't serve until you go beyond. <laughs> True service begins yes. when you go beyond. That's why this flesh is powerful. That's why it's easy to draw electric light and natural light. Yeah. It's so hard. It's easy to pick this up. Isn't it? But to go beyond to draw that Shekinah glory of the light of the Father. Do you know why Jesus now abides as a priest forever? No wonder the apostles say that he is at the Father's right hand. What is he doing as God's high priest interceding? Why, why is it that we need to be in the seat of form? Because Jesus knew this is exactly what will happen to all of us. It's going to be a battle for many of us to go beyond the veil. We can be standing as close as, as can be near the veil. That's why Paul talks about that veil in his Corinthian letters. Amen. I can't take you to a lot of scriptures today. What I have, what I have shared, what I have talked with you today. Last night, 
It is to spur you to read the Hebrew letter. Not because it's only, it's not because I'm saying it. It has to be your companion, it has to be a letter that you will travel with all the days of your life. Which one is easy? Someone come and ask you. What's your gift, brother? Oh, 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 hallelujah. I think God has made me an apostle. All right. I said, and I have someone wrote me a letter and said that, you know, I think, I think it is time for me to move in the apostolic. Can you imagine? This person say it's think he th this person think it is time now to move <laughs> in the <laughs> <laughs> you know, like what Pastor Su said to me, I think it's time for me to take the train from UB to Moscow five days. You know why we can do that? You know why we can do that? It's the easiest thing to say. Seconds you can say that. I think it's time now for me to serve God here, there, this, that, go here, go there. It's the easiest thing to say. I've noticed all my life it is hard to find a man ever open his mind and say, I think God has moved in my heart to be a priest again. I will be one person that has ever come up to me and said that to me. Only one. And that was the beginning of a relationship where I never forgot that moment where he handed a small little booklet to me. Call up my name, he said, Read this. Read this and then share it with me. It was a book about a royal priesthood written by Bashelia Schwenk. It's a German sister who understand more about priesthood than most men that I know today. Because this was his this was his longing for the church. Can you imagine he's Jewish? He's a Jewish man. He's giving it to a Gentile. Reminding a Gentile, we Jews were the first one to receive this. We lost it. We lost it. Look, look, look at us as a people today. We're everything that the world wants us to be, except being priestly. We are everything that the world wants us to be, except being priestly. And may the church, may the Gentile church understand this. Only one. That's why we're traveling in the nations. We just returned from Uganda. Why do we do this? Why do I? Where? Why do we spend our time coming to small congregations like you? Because God is looking for. Because God is looking for priests. And it's the only means He has chosen to bring His kingdom to the midst of His people. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. We just worship you. Let's lift our hands, shall we? Thank you, God. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We give you praise. We give you thanks, Father. Oh, God, we give you thanks. Let's, let's open our mouth. Let's begin to thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. 
Bring this. Bring this to the church. Bring it to the people. Press this home. Press this home, God. Come, draw men, draw hearts, draw eyes. Draw individual, draw this community, draw this body of Jesus, of your body, Jesus, whom you are the head. Draw this. Bring the ones and the truth to yourself. Bring that. Restore your priestly order. Restore the order of thou Christ. Long to see the fruits, Lord, of which you have travailed in your soul. Bring this, my God. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. As the God of your kind of praise. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have it the watch that 
үнэхээр та бид нэг уучлаа. Бид үнэхээр саатгаж тэнэс ямар их зөв хийж ордтой байсан юм бэ? Бид өөрсдөөр ямар их чармаад ямар их өөрсдөө ямар олдны амж дүр төрхөөр илэрхийл гэж харуулдаж ордтой байсан ба. Тэр бүх зүйл бид хаймаар үнэхээр та уучлаа. Та бидэнд гимшлэг илгээгээч. Юр бусын сүсний гимшлэг та бидний дунд асгаач, та ажилладаач. Зүгээр та чөлөөт айлдаж аваа. Би ч өшөөр баран аваа. Би таны өмнө гимш баран. Би өөрсдөө зүр сэтгэл дотор чаддгүй байсан зүсгээ тэрнө. Гимшгийг үнэхээр хүсчихэн аа. Бид мэдхгүй байсан гэдэг гимш баран аваа. Бидний бардан байдал, бидний их хэмсэг байдлууд, их хэмсэг замгууд нүрч устаж үгүй болох болохгүй. Түр тэмэн гимш баран аваа. Халлелуя. Тэгэл аваа зүгээр. Халлелуя. Ава тэгэл үнэхээр бид үнэхээр таны жинхэнэ гэрэлчэн баймаг байна. Энэ утгыг хэлээч та яриач аа. Үнэхээр бидний дотор тэр гэрлэг нь бодож өгөөч. Тэг ямар ч явах байх. Бид нэг гэрэлчэнгээ дөрлөөд гэрэлтнгээ дөрлөөд гэрэлтгийн мангээ дөрлөөд хани дуус оруулсан аа. Аа та дахин боломж хараас их зүйлсэн чи таны баярлалаа. Халлелуя. Аллоо. Оо, шин цагийн төв их танд аргалар өгч наваа. Шин хийж байгаа юр бусын таны ажлуудын төлөө төлөөний төлөө юр бусын айхын хүмүүсийн төлөө танд аргалар өгч наваа. Үнэхээр та орхоо өгч та юм шиг нэг мартаг та юм шиг дуусгаа өгч танд баярлаа аваа. Юм төгсөн хэрэг өгч наваа танд баярлаа. Юм шиг үнэхээр та гэж хараж ирж байгаа өгч наваа. Юм гай өгч шин шинт өгч наваа. Бид танд аргалар ин цаг ин өчүүд ин төлө та бид нэг хийс хийж байсан бүхэл үлдүүд ин төлө тань баярлалаа ва халлелуя үнхээр тань баярлалаа бүхэн таны өшөөл нэгүүсэл хайрын төлөө таны өөчлөлийн төлөө үнхээр тань баярлалаа халлелуя та юу ч мартаг бүхэн үнхээр та юу ч ортой го Аллилуйя. Та энэ сууж байгаа их хүн нэг их ч та мартаагүй аа. Аминь. Хүн болгоны амьдр танд үн цэнтэй юм аа бүр хүн нэ. Хүн болгоны амьдр танд үнгээр юр бусын юм аа. Хүн нэг үр таны хувьд үнхээр хайрдаг хамгаалт үнхээр таны хийдэг зүйлс ч юм аа. Аминь. Үнхээр танд баярлаа бүр хүн. Аллилуйя Иесус. Аллилуйя. Аллилуйя. Тийм аа гэхээр үнэхээр бид нүгсүүлэн яриарай. Тэгээд үнэхээр та бид хүн юмсуудыг нээж өгөөр. Тэгээд бид үнэхээр салмаар байна аа. Үнэхээр бид хүсэж байна аа. Бурхан таны үнэн зүйл бид хүсэж байна аа. Тэгээд таны зүг байд бид ижлгий бид хүсэж байна аа. Бид үнэхээр өөрийнхөө амьдралтай байдаг. Бүхэл чадахгүй зүйлс үү бол чаддаг зүйлс өөрөөсөө нэг бууж өгч таны тань өөрсдөө амьдрдаг хүмүүс яа. Өөрөөр бид нэг зүрхэн нутагдаач би ч өшөөж ин. Бурхан та бид нэг зүрхэн нутагдаач миний зүрх цаг байгаач. Өөрөөр та миний зүрх та өөрөөр зүрх нь хийгээч. Та өөрийн хүсэлтүүдийг миний зүрхэнд хийж өгөөч. Миний хүсэл мөрөөдлүүдийг биш хар та өөрийнхөө хүсэлтүүдийг миний зүрхэнд хийж болох аваа. Таны хүсэл ихээр өрөө утгаараа миний амьдлаар биед олох болохгүй. Зөвхөн таны хүсэж байгаа зүйлс үү? Аллилуйя. Та ижил жах болохгүй. Та ижлэр байх болохгүй. Та үнэхээр бүх юм шиг дүүр гэж шиг таал байх болохгүй аа. Халлелуя. Бид таны гарт таарч байна. Бид таны гарт өрж байна аа. Халлелуя. Хайр баярлаа аа. Өнөөдөр та өөрийн хайртай огтууд хөвгүүдэд хайртай гэсэн төлөө таар баярлаа аа. Халлелуя. Бүх хат үзэх нь хайр байх болохгүй. Есүс Та бид нэг их хийсэн бүх зүйлсүүд бидний зүрх нь нээлттэй байх болохгүй. Тэр бол хэрэгтэй байна. Улам хүлээж авах хэрэгтэй байна. Тэр миний амьдрал байгаас гэж бодож байна. Тэр миний амьдралын бүр дүр гэсэн хэсгүүд нь байгаас гэж бид хүсэж байна аваа. Тиймээс та юусуудыг улам үзүү нээж ойлголтуудыг бус мэдлгүүдийг сүсдэ юу гэсэн чадваруудыг бид нар бол суулгаж авах болохгүй. Бидний бүр хүний хүний гэсэн бүх зонжоор бусдаж өгөх болох болохгүй. Бидний гэсэн бүх ааш харшин гоо бол хүмүүсийн мэдлгүүд боловсруулууд мөн өнгөр зайлах болохгүй бидний амьдралаас. Бидний ойн болоос бидний сэтгэлээс 
зайсан байх болтугаар харин бүхний зүсэл бидний амьдрал энэ үүрэг юу бүсийн хүч чадал бидний эзлэн авсан тийм цагийг үнэлж болтугаар үнэхээ бид амьдрал маань тэр чигтээ түүгээр дүүрэг ирсэн түүний зүүд байдлаар түүний баяр хөрөөд үргэлжлэн цаг үеэр үргэлжлэх болтугаар бид халийн нүдээ том гэж байна тэр гадар зөвхөн тал байх болтугаар бидний амьдралаар би та амьдралаар үүсвэл гадар зөвхөн тал байх болтугаар Аллилуйя. Бүх зүйл нэгэн өдр байх болохгүй. Тэгээд таны бар таатчихэд бид таны бас өрөөж байна. Бас таны хайртай байх гэж. Үнэхээр үнэхээр таньтай ажилхан байж таны хэлдэг байна. Тэгээд бид таны амьдрал үнэхээр нэс нэст өндөр төрхөн гүн чанарын илэрхийлэх тэр амьдрал дэлс амин байх болохгүй. Amen. 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 Amen.